Well, I'm really glad you're here today. And uh, first thing I want to say is this is Happy Mother's Day. I don't just say happy, I don't just say Mother's Day, I say Happy Mother's Day. That's how I used to say it at home. It's a day for happy mothers. <laughs> so if you're not happy, maybe, this day, maybe we got another day for you. Actually, actually, this is what I want you to think, first of all, for all you moms and for all the relationships you have with your moms, this is actually the first Mother's Day I don't have a mother to send a card to and, uh, or call today. And so it's just kind of an unusual uh, blip on my radar screen. And I know that some of you are in similar situations, or maybe the relationship with your mom is a little strained right now, and that conversation feels harder. Or maybe, as a woman, you have all the longings and desires to be a mom, and that hasn't happened yet. And so this is what I would say. In your mind, as best you can, find the memory that brings the greatest smile to your face and peace to your heart. And then trust that even if you haven't had your own child yet, that God can give you a way to exercise the mom muscles in your world. And so we just ask that God would bless you today. Also, I just wanted to make a quick uh, reminder that next Saturday, the 15th, we're doing a, a membership, uh, exploring membership class. And if you're interested in finding out what membership means, because this is our biggest challenge uh, sometimes, is people assume they know what membership here means because they know what membership someplace else has meant. So there's no pressure put on you. It's just a lot of clarification. Breakfast is included. The way you can sign up for that is by going to R, the letter R for Rochester, calvary.org forward slash membership, and you'll be able to register from that spot and we'll be able to spend a little time together and just talk through what that means here and where we think God is leading our church family to go, maybe how you could be a part of that. We're in a series on worship, and uh, so I'd like to start uh, today in Genesis chapter 15. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram. And if you don't know who Abram is, he has a name change in a few chapters in Genesis, and he's going to be called Abraham. And uh, this is what God says. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless and the one who will inherit my estate is Eleazar of Damascus? And Abram said, uh, you have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. And the word of the Lord came to him and said, this man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside. Look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. And he said to him, so shall your offspring be. And then this is, a, this is one of the most important sentences in all of scripture. Abraham believed the Lord, and he credited it to him as righteousness. He also said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur, of the Chaldeans, that's the place that he lived previously, to this land to take possession of it. But Abraham said, Sovereign Lord, how can I know that I will gain possession of it? So the Lord said to him, Bring me a heifer, a goat, a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. Abraham brought all those to him, cut them in two, and arranged the halves opposite each other. The birds, however, he did not cut in half. Then birds of prey came down on the carcasses, but Abram drove them away. As the sun was setting, Abram fell into a deep sleep, and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. It's, it's not actually dark yet, but darkness came over him. And then the Lord said to him, Know for certain that for 400 years your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and they will be enslaved and mistreated there. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and afterward they will come out with great possessions. You, however, will go to your ancestors in peace and be buried at a good old age. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here, 
for the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. That's a fascinating statement. Some people think that um, possession of land in the Old Testament or in the, the ancient world was just all about whoever had the stronger military capacity or that God was playing favorites. And, and God is giving the Amorites a chance to make an adjustment in the way that they live. And I would go into some of the things that they did, but it's probably not a great topic for Mother's Day. And then the sun had set, darkness had fallen, a smoking firepot and a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. And on that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram and said, to your descendants, I give this land. From the Wadi of Egypt, the great river, the Euphrates, and the land of the Kenites, Kenizzites, Cadmonites, Hittites, Perizzites, Raphaites, Amorites, Canaanites, Gergesites, Jebusites. I should get credit just for saying all those ites. <laughs> yeah. um, the thing I want us to see primarily today is that it's desire that drives worship. Desire drives worship. Uh, there are some people who prefer not to worship God. The bottom line is they don't really desire God. There are some people who choose to worship God, but not because they desire God. Some people worship God because they believe God can get them the things that they desire. But there are some people who actually desire God. So God said, I am your shield and your very great reward. And it sounds like an odd statement, and it is if it's out of context. And unfortunately, the context of this passage is not in the verses that we read today. To understand the context, we actually have to take a review of the two previous chapters. Abraham, or uh, if, I, if I say Abraham, I'm referring to Abram, his name just hasn't changed yet. Abram had left with his family and his possessions, and he's traveling to a place he does not know. God is going to show him step by step along the way. He took his nephew with him. His nephew's name was Lot. And they were uh, reasonably uh, wealthy by their day's standards. And so they had lots of flocks and lots of herds. And they had shepherds that would be able to take care of them. And, and the animal population that they had had increased so much that it was difficult to find fields where there was enough grass or watering holes where there was enough space for the animals to get to all that they needed. And so what happened is, because the shepherds were responsible for the livestock, they began to quarrel with the, each other, Abram's shepherds quarreling against Lot's shepherds and vice versa to make sure their animals got the better part. And Abram actually comes to Lot and he says, it's not good that our shepherds are quarreling. And it, it, it's interesting, but it, it says, that there are Canaanites and Perizzites in the land. And it sounds like it's just an offhanded comment, but, but it's a it's really powerful truth. What Abram is saying is, is when, when we're surrounded by people who are potentially our enemies, it's probably not good that in our arguments we show weakness, because that can be taken advantage of. I wish Christians would think more like nomads. We're constantly surrounded by people who are watching and looking for weakness. And yet it is so common that we see Christians attacking each other. And we have no idea how in our effort to prove maybe we're right on a particular topic, we actually expose the weakness of another. And then the name of Jesus winds up getting dragged through mud. So Abram's solution was is that they were going to part ways that one person would go one direction, the other person would go the other direction, that way there would be enough field and enough food. They don't own any of the land, but in the ancient world, if you were passing through, you kind of had grazing rights, as long as you didn't camp out there and claim it as your own. And so he tells Lot, you get to choose which direction you want to go and which land you want. And Lot, who's the nephew, he's the junior ranking member of the family, looks at Abram and he says, I want this section over here, and it was the best by a lot. And so Abram says, fine, and, and he goes. Uh, lot, not too long after that, 
winds up getting caught up in a tribal warfare. It was a battle of kings that involved nine, nine kings, five kings against four kings. And Lot and his family wound up becoming prisoners of war in that battle, and they got carried away. When Abram heard about this, he, like I said, he had a lot of livestock. He also had a lot of servants, and he went and called up 318 of them who he had trained to go on an overnight rescue mission. And they just took off after the, these kings that had uh, taken his family prisoner of war. And he not only rescued them and brought back their possessions, he also rescued everything and everyone that those kings had taken. So when they come back, one of the defeated kings comes to his, actually the king of Sodom, comes to Abram and says, I'll tell you what, I'll give you a reward. I'll give you a reward. You can have so much of the stuff that you brought back. And Abram just looks at it and he says, I, I took an oath before God. I raised my hand. I said I wouldn't do that. I didn't go get them to get something out of it. That's not why I did it. And he wouldn't do it. And then he has an interaction with a person who's called the King of Salem, who's a high priest. His name is Melchizedek. He's a very mystical figure who not only appears in the Old Testament, but also is talked about quite a lot in the New Testament, particularly in the book of Hebrews. And Abram recognizes that he is a high priest of the Most High God, and he comes to him and he gives to him a tenth of everything he has. Who does this? Who does this? I want you to think about what kind of person this is. He doesn't demand his preference. He could have chosen the better land. He didn't. When his nephew took that choice, it made his life a little more complicated. He didn't complain about that. And when, when his nephew became a prisoner of war, he actually marshaled the forces of his house and at personal risk and expense pursued and fought for the person that made his life more complicated. And he didn't take a reward or a bribe when offered, and he's generous and gives away 10%. What drives this man? Because that's not how our world works. And that's not how our culture tells you to do it. When you have the opportunity, you take the best thing that you can possibly get. And if somebody complicates your life and they need help, you let them just figure it out on their own. And if somebody offers you a reward, you take it. And if, 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 someone, uh, if, if someone gives you an opportunity to, to give something away, you better think twice about that because you don't know how much you're going to have for how long. So what drives him? And what drives him what drives Abram is conversations he's had with God. That's what drives him. Those conversations changed everything about how he thought about the world, about how he thought about his life. And so what you build your life on will shape the life you build. What you build your life on will shape the life you build. We only really have two choices on what we build on, and it will shape the life we build. So he has these conversations, and in these conversations, God gives direction and makes promises. And Abram believes that and actually makes his decisions based on that because he doesn't want to settle for less or miss out on what God has for him. So God uses these phrases, I am your shield. I will defend you. Why? Because God saw in Abraham something of great value and worth defending. Would you please hear that for yourself today? God sees you as someone of great value. He wants to be your shield. And he said, I am your very great reward. Now, I will give you a very great reward. I am your very great reward. Now, as soon as, as he says that, Abram starts talking, and it almost sounds like if we don't know the context, like he's asking for something or asking for more, but he's not. What he's saying is this. He's saying, I know that, that you are my reward, and I know you're incredibly generous. In fact, so generous, it's often difficult to distinguish the giver from the gift. 
But my challenge is, I have no one to pass this on to. To have much and no option to share was unthinkable for Abram. And he said, right now, my only plan is uh, Elazar, who is a faithful servant, long time in my house, he's going to get everything. And God interrupts. How many, it's okay with you if God interrupts your thought? Yeah, you, more of us should be a little bit more okay with that. And he said, it's not going to be your servant. You're going to have a son, flesh and blood. Look at the stars. Just like you lose count of them, you'll lose count of how many descendants I will give you. So Abram believed the Lord and God credited it to him for righteousness. Please hear this. Faith doesn't just believe God exists. Faith believes what God says. Oh, I believe there's a God. That's not faith. I believe what God says. That's when it starts turning into faith. Because God makes promises and he gives direction. A life built on faith requires promises. This is, we've only got two things we can build our lives on. One is faith and the other is fear. You are building a life right now on one of those foundations. And what I can tell you is, whichever foundation you choose will shape the life that you build. And I can also tell you, you cannot get into a place of peace or confidence building on a foundation of fear. Well, I don't know. I don't know if I don't know if God exists. I don't know if I agree with what God says. I don't know if I can I don't know how he's going to do this. I don't see how God can work in my life. I don't see how my life can change. I don't see what difference this can make. Yes. All of those things are true of all of us at some time in our lives. And this is what is also true. Faith says, I believe what God says even when I can't see what he's doing. That's what it means. That that we, we accept promises are a part of life. You've all made them. We, I've, I've made lots of promises in my life. Tried to keep every one of them, some more successfully than others. But there's a difference in promises, right? There's a difference in saying, uh, I'll give you a call sometime. That's kind of a promise. Or, uh, I choose you to be my spouse for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and health until death us do part. How many can tell there's a difference between the gravity of those two promises, right? Um, a promise that we should get together for lunch or a promise for a 30-year mortgage. There's a difference, and they're treated differently. I've officiated weddings, and... Uh, and when you get to those words, uh, for richer, for poor, in sickness and in health, forsaking all others, how long am I keeping this promise? Until death. What a happy little note to put into a wedding celebration. We're, we've all gathered here today to talk about the fact that you're going to make a promise until one of you dies and you're not allowed to kill the other one. It's just how it is. Um, you, 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 make a, 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 you take a mortgage out on a house. I've been in the room when you take a mortgage out and, and, and the bank is there and attorneys are there and there's, it feels like a hundred documents to sign. And, and what are you doing when you make those kinds of promises? You're giving permission to everyone who witnesses it. If I fail to live up to the promise that I am making... I give you the right to hold me accountable. In fact, I give you the right to take something from me. If you don't make your mortgage payments, the bank will come and take your house and probably some other stuff. And the state will not go, that's stealing. The state will go, no, you made a promise. That's what happens. Promises are a big deal. And that's, what, that's the ceremony that we're seeing here. God isn't just saying, I'll call you sometime. God isn't saying, we should get together again soon. 
God is, is making a covenant with Abraham and Abraham with God. And so this is how they did it in the ancient world. They didn't get lawyers and, and, and bankers together. They, they didn't put a lot of people in a room to witness and celebrate. This is what they would do. They would take some animals and they would cut them in half. Not an easy thing to do. Not that I've ever done it, but just the imagination of it makes me uncomfortable. Okay? A goat and a heifer and just, you're, you're, going to, you're, you're going to have to kill them and then you're going to have to cut them in half. And then you spread the halves between. So there's five animals that the, uh, the birds were not cut in half, but everything else was. And then this is how the ceremony goes, okay? Everything's spread out there. And then the two people making the covenant with each other walk through the middle of the severed carcasses of animals. And this is the promise that they're making to each other. If I don't keep my word, if I don't keep my word, may what happened to these animals happen to me. How many are glad we upgraded the wedding ceremony to not include <laughs> the dead animals? <laughs> It's, it's a fascinating study, a huge commitment. It takes faith. It takes faith to make a promise, and it takes faith to believe one. And we are called to build a life on faith. So there's this huge covenant celebration or ceremony but there's something really weird that happens here. By the way, this is one of the truly interesting, strange stories of the Old Testament. And Abraham is, is he's exhausted and he's going through a great darkness personally. And then the sun sets and in the darkness, God walks through the severed carcasses of the animals. And if we're not familiar with the culture of ancient world, it doesn't mean anything to us. Abraham never walked through it. Abraham beats off birds of prey and passes out on a rock. And God gives him very valuable information while he's, he's kind of in between conscious and unconscious. But Abram never walked through. <sighs> He had asked God, how will I know? How will I know I will take possession of this land? And this is what God says. I will make a promise. And if you are unable to live up to your end, I will be the one that pays the price. I'm the only one making a commitment here. There was another day that great darkness fell on the land. You read about it in the Gospels. It's great darkness fell on the place where Jesus is being crucified. And what's happening? We have not been able to live up to the covenant of God. We have failed, sometimes on purpose, sometimes by accident. It doesn't matter. If I miss my mortgage payment by accident, it puts certain things in, in place. We've all failed. And this is what God says. I'll pay the price for your failure. And that's what we celebrate at the Lord's table today, that God sends his son who gives his life. Now, fear is the most common foundation that people build their lives on. They're afraid that God won't keep his word. They're afraid that we won't have enough. We're afraid that we'll miss out on something. But a foundation of fear never makes you feel safe. Abram believed God even though he couldn't see how his life was going to work out. He couldn't see how God was going to make this possible. He couldn't see how a couple of his age could ever have a baby. He wasn't afraid that God would fail, but he was pretty sure he had or would. And God makes the covenant because faith is more about trust than it is about sight. It's more about who you trust than what you see. That's a life of faith. So that's who the gospel is for. People who know they don't have enough to live up to their end of the bargain. And that's why the gospel is so offensive 
to very self-confident people. They can see how they're going to make their life work. And they can see what they put in place. And they can see how they can partner with or use people to get what they want. And so it's very hard for a self-confident person to accept a concept that says, you won't ever be able to live up and someone else will pay the price for you. That's exactly what God does. So when the sun rose early the next day, Abram wasn't any younger. His wife wasn't pregnant. He didn't have anything new. But he had God. God is his great reward. I'm going to ask the worship team to come out. At the cross, we see God keeping the covenant. At the cross, we can decide if we will believe what God says. If we will not just acknowledge that he exists, but actually make decisions based on the wisdom that he offers. God is the great reward. God is the great reward. He's generous and he gives lots of things. But the great reward is him. The source of all life experienced death. So that we who experience death could experience life to the full. That's what he does for us. So this morning, um, I'm never quite sure why people show up in a room like this to hear a guy like me. Maybe it's a habit. Maybe it's just um, a commitment. I think that when I surround myself with people of faith and listen to words of scripture, that there's an investment in my life. Maybe you're at your wit's end and you're hoping something would happen today that will make sense of what you're going through or resolve some problem that you're experiencing. I suspect there are all of those reasons and more. I, I suspect that there are people who, they want to find the love of their life. They want their marriage to get better. They want their kids to make good choices. They want their body to be healed. All those things, all good things. Nothing wrong with any of that. Not one thing. But is that why we came? To get a reward from God? Or maybe today, we could turn the page, set aside all of those things, and just want God for who He is. I am your very great reward. That's what he says. So this morning, I'm going to ask you to stand. We'll put these back on. And we're going to sing. And we're not going to sing about something we can get from God. We're just going to tell God how much we love him and being with him this morning. Let's all stand together.